I did not realize that Jerry Brown had a lot more in common than Margaret Thatcher than I thought. Uh, his, um, his frugality, his personality. Um, and I was struck in the, uh, near the beginning of the film by the narration which referred to our times as the era of the tax revolt. Um, Jason and Camille, what did you mean by that? Um, I, I think that what we, what we really wanted to do um, is put a kind of frame around the, the time period that we all live in and all, most of us grew up in. You know, I think if you were under like 60, I guess, you have very little memory of that sort of pre-1978 period when there was just a very different uh, attitude, a very different idea about what it was possible to accomplish with the, you know, with the, the levers of government. Um, you know, nowadays when we have a problem, you know, like walking around the streets of San Francisco or anywhere in California right now, for example, uh, we're, you know, almost overwhelmed by the problem of homelessness. And the idea that government could be a solution for that um, in, in uh, our current way of thinking about things, it's almost unthinkable. Whereas back then, I think if you, you know, imagine the same uh, phenomenon happening in the 50s or early 60s, of course government would have stepped in and done something about it. I think that we've, we've, um, we have a learned sense of hopelessness or futility. Um, and, you know, I don't think, I think that that's just um, uh, a function of what we grew up with, but it's not really, doesn't really say anything about our country or about the state of California. I think in our history, if you look past this, you know, 40 year period, um, we haven't always been that way. And that was sort of our goal at some level was to kind of put parentheses around this period and, and uh, you know, potentially open up people's idea, eyes to other possibilities. Camille, do you, do you have a note about that? That was good, okay. <laughs> so Tanosh, uh, by way of introduction, self-introduction, um, how do you react or how do you, how do you relate to that film? Well, I've worked, uh, you know, in and around California politics for about 20 years, I would say. Um, you know, I worked for the California Democratic Party from 2010, which was the um, third election of Jerry Brown as governor uh, when he was running against Meg Whitman campaign where he was actually outspent together with the party uh, five to one, but still managed to win, which then put him in position, as the film talks about, to pass Proposition 30, which, you know, included a one quarter penny uh, temporary sales tax increase and a increase um, of personal uh, income tax for the wealthiest Californians to stop the cuts to education. So I think that on a, I think on a tactical level there's that, but for me, you know, having, like I said, worked in politics in California for about 20 years, just how much of the work that I've done is how much time has been taken up trying to mitigate, I guess, the negative effects of Proposition 13. Uh, and the short answer is a whole lot. Um, so, uh, you know, thankfully, I think Megan could get to this, but there is uh, actually a fix to all of this that we're all gonna have a chance to uh, vote on in November, which is a positive, uh, uh, you know, certainly a, a positive uh, note to end on. But I think the, for me, I think also the film does an incredible job, and this is testament to the filmmakers, of taking a very complex issue and just, I mean, doing a great job of explaining the history and providing context and just getting every part of the story in there from Jarvis to Jerry Brown to the impacts, you know, the effects that this had on the sort of Republican tax cut only ideology. So that for me, I was just impressed as a, as a viewer of the film. So you're close to Jerry Brown. Did he feel bad about his um, role in Prop 13? Well, I, I wouldn't say that I'm close to Jerry Brown. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I would say that, you know, he was uh, somebody, I, I think there's a myth around uh, Jerry that he sort of, you know, saw what ended up happening with Prop 13 and he sort of caught religion and, you know, was opposed to, uh, you know, tax increases after that. But if you look at the history, I think he came in, when he first initially came in, uh, he said this is the era of limits for California. So that legendary frugality began before that. Um, you know, and, and 
in a way, that frugality ended up actually working to his benefit in 2010 when he had to convince Californians that he would be the right person to tackle these very serious problems that California had. I mean, would we have like a 20, 26 billion uh, dollar deficit it talks about? So because of him coming in and I think then with Proposition 30, um, getting the state back into the black, you know, going from 26 billion negative to six billion surplus again, ended up being a positive. Um, Megan, so do you think he went far enough though? With Prop 30? Yeah, I, I actually really relate to uh, one of the students that we heard from towards the very end of the film, because that, that story that she shared is sort of also my story. Uh, I was not born when Prop 13 was passed, um, and I entered school uh, much like she did in 2008 in the, the heat of the financial crisis and, and lack of funding for our schools. So I really lived out that legacy that Prop 13 created in our state and was completely unaware of it during my youth about why our schools were so overcrowded and why our public services were so underfunded. Uh, and my generation, I think, is really uh, the generation that's uh, bearing a lot of the brunt of that still today, right? Um, our public transit infrastructure isn't sufficient for me to always get to work on time. Uh, I probably never will be able to afford to buy a house in California um, because of a lack of affordable housing options for, for people in my generation. Um, and I, I actually dropped out of college because I couldn't afford to continue on with my schooling at the time. Um, so I think that the impacts of Prop 13 are really uh, real for me personally. Uh, and then on a professional level, um, I work as the advocacy director uh, at a local nonprofit here uh, and we sit on the executive committee of the schools and communities first campaign and we're, we're joined by many other amazing organizations like League of Women Voters and ACLU, uh, ACE Action, uh, the California Teachers Association and, and too many others to mention uh, that are working on uh, the first viable reform to Prop 13 uh, that we, we've seen in 40 years, which is the Schools and Communities Funding Act, uh, which will be on the 2020 ballot. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'll talk a little bit more about that probably later, but um, I'm really passionate about reforming Prop 13 and, and what that can do for our communities. Um, I think as Tanoch noted, uh, Prop 30 did a lot to, to kind of fix that gap, but I think it's really apparent to all of us with the crisis that we're seeing in our communities here around people experiencing homelessness, lack of affordable housing, crumbling infrastructure, uh, that, that Prop 30 on its own is just not enough. Uh, and so we need to look further uh, to how we can reform Prop 13 to create some more revenue for our communities. I just want to I just want to say that I'm I'm thrilled that this is um, this is the conversation we're having, and this is what you know the the discussion leads to. Because when we started making this film, it really the goal was we struggled a lot with, you know. What is this film going to be? How far, how far is the film going to go into the, the consequences of Prop 13? And that's like a huge thing. And we obviously made the choice to stay further back in history to really uh, explain what it is because we always thought that this film would be a, a great conversation starter because there's so much to discuss. It covers so many different areas that at least gaining back some understanding of how did, we, how did it happen, how did we get here? Would, would be productive, so this is very exciting. Yes, um, what, oh, sorry, go ahead. What's interesting to me is this arc of, of the history where we came from a state where we were very much pro-government to now where we're just poo-pooing government and basically to the point where government isn't serving us because we've annihilated it so much. Um, did you? Um. I will say something about that, which is, you know, one of the things that did not make it into the film, but it's, I think, you know, the film is pretty dense already, so it was one of those things that just had to uh, get cut. But, um, you know, the way that we govern California right now, it's a very complex, complicated state. It's obviously, it's like one-sixth of the country. Um, but we have like a kind of non-functioning legislature, and the reason for that is because we govern largely through the initiative process. And prior to Prop 13, that really wasn't the case. Prop 13 was such an earthquake and was so successful that it, it launched a, you know, what people called the initiative industrial complex where uh, 
you know, lobbyists basically do, um, you know, focus group testing of ideas that they can then raise money off of, which they then put on the ballot, and then that's how the legislation gets created, and then the legislators in Sacramento, rather than like doing their job, or, you know, what we basically hired them to do, which would be, you know, use their expertise to create legislation, instead they're basically just reacting to the stuff that we keep, you know, throwing at them, and because we create these really complex formulas, and and they're just kind of sitting around in these rooms, like trying to figure out how to make the formulas fit together, which is almost impossible. So, we've kind of turned California into an ungovernable state, um, and it's one of the unintended consequences, I think, of Proposition 13. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll pick up on that. I mean, I, I think that's uh, governing by initiative. I mean, there's been plenty of people who have written about, uh, you know, how detrimental that is. Uh, I do think that there is uh, room there for the legislature, and you see it step in from time to time. But there's no doubt that uh, you know that uh, special interests, wealthy interests, take advantage of the initiative process. And you know, the grand irony is that it was initially introduced as a progressive era reform. I think in 1911 or so, uh, at the time, as a potential tool that could be used against the main special interest at the time, which was the the railroad uh, industry. Uh, there's no doubt now because of paid signature gathering, et cetera, just anybody who has, you know, $10 million and up, you know, could easily get something, anything they want on the ballot. Whether or not that passes is still focus group and poll tested, et cetera. But yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I do think that also Prop 13 is still viewed in a lot of ways as the third rail of California politics. Um, the, the measure schools and communities uh, first that we have, uh, that we're trying to qualify for the ballot through the petitioning process and, and hopefully will appear before voters as an initiative uh, came down that way because when we tried to get the legislature to take leadership in reforming Prop 13, uh, they were unresponsive to that, right? Many politicians still fear sort of the power of those Orange County, Southern California anti-tax advocates. Um, so we still very much are living out the legacy um, that was created during Prop 13 era uh, that that makes uh, it hard to touch that reform, but we're trying to do it. <laughs> so there's there seems to be three characters in the movie. There's Jerry Brown, who we touched on a little bit, um, and the voters, and Howard Jarvis, Howard Jarvis himself. Uh -huh. um, and you were just touching on the voters. Uh, do you think that the voters are different today? Would they respond? to a tax reform uh, now that Orange County is not as white anymore and that there are more immigrants there and there are more Asians and more Latinos, are we more likely to tax ourselves for services? I, I just wanna say just a short thing yeah. as a non-original Californian okay. coming here that you know we can say a lot of bad things about voters and how dumb they are and the decisions that they make, whatever. But I want to say it is crazy the amount of stuff you need to know when you go to the, to the ballot box and the understanding you need to have when you vote on these things. It makes no sense, you know, to... to, to it's democracy supposed. Yeah, but it's, it's making, it, you know, it, it's also, you know, that's why you vote people in office that are supposed to be expert about certain things. And, and now we're asking all the voters to, to be experts about everything and really read the fine line behind every proposition and that was the populist revolt i'm sorry that's the populist revolt i yeah. think yeah i think um california's version of direct democracy is probably the most extreme um certainly in the country and one of the most extreme in the world in terms of how little oversight the the um the legislature has um you know we have uh referendum you can you do a recall on you know like they did on Gray Davis. Um, you have referenda. You have initiatives. It's we we have direct democracy in California, and it worked, I think, for a long time. But in the post Prop 13 era, we've it's become, I think, too extreme. It's become unmanageable. Uh, yeah, in terms of voters, would they pass this now? I mean, I, I don't know. To your point about Orange County, uh, this uh, just the 2018 election. Uh, became, Orange County became, uh, you know, it's gone from this sort of red Republican bastion to an area that now doesn't have a single Republican representing it in Congress, right? 
so that's a massive shift, and and uh, you know I I think um, to your point, it's yeah, it's it's more diverse than it was before. That doesn't mean that they're uh, necessarily going to swing the other way immediately, but change is afoot there. So I don't know that 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 this would pass today because it's an entirely different environment today. Uh, but yeah, that's I, I think that's an important point is to you know. Southern California in particular seems to be a character in the film, and that's where you know Howard Jarvis drew a lot of his support. The film also talks about the John Birch Society a little bit, uh, and and you know they were sort of a an influential force, particularly in Orange County, and that's that Orange County no longer exists. But um, I think all 58 counties in California voted for Proposition 13. I think the only um, the only uh, ethnic group or you know group in California that did not vote was African did not vote for Prop 13 was African Americans. Every other you know how you uh, slice and dice the um, the electorate voted in favor of Prop 13. And you know the Public Policy Institute of California continues to pull Proposition 13's uh, favorability, and it really hasn't changed that much over the years. It's still like in the mid 60s. Um, so, you know, there's a big question about how much we've changed in terms of our attitudes towards these things. I think there is like a kind of iconic stature that Proposition 13 has in California so that there's, you know, people identify it with saving their home or saving, you know, their mom's home or their grandparents' home or whatever. So I think Prop 13 itself is, it's hard to fight it. Um, I think Prop 30, though, shows that if it's done responsi responsibly, um, Californians are willing to tax themselves if they feel they're going to get something uh, that they you know, really want or need in return, and if they feel that the, the government is um, you know, being um, uh, prudent with their money. Yeah, I, I want to add on and say your you know, original question of like, will we tax ourselves? Um, and the beautiful thing about our reform is that we don't ask people to tax themselves. Um, something that the, the film mentioned sort of briefly um, is that the biggest winners of Proposition 13 was corporate and industrial property owners. Um, and, and we had a short news clip in there, I think, where they mentioned, you know, Standard Oil was going to save millions of dollars and uh, all of these other corporate corporate interests. Um, and so our reform asks uh, not to, to tax yourself, but to tax the corporations. Um, we ask that uh, we reform Prop 13 just on the corporate and industrial side and that corporations pay market rate property taxes. Uh, and that will raise $12 billion for schools and local services annually, um, which would be about a 10% increase to California's budget, which would be huge. Um, so uh, the question still remains about whether or not Californians will tax themselves, but I think Californians will uh, tax big corporations that won out big from Prop 13. Uh, and the polling is showing that. It's polling at about 60% amongst voters. Um, so the only thing we have to do now is qualify it for the ballot. Yeah, but it's interesting that there's uh, <laughs> the, oh, the, 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 the sort of iconic stature of Prop 13 continues to play this role where, you know, it depends how the reform measure polls uh, is highly dependent on how you ask the question. And if you talk about it as a reform of Proposition 13, then people don't like it. But if, right. you, if you talk about it as a, uh, you know, closing the, loop, the loophole on uh, commercial and industrial properties, then people like it. Yep. But they have the sense that Prop 13, oh, you can't touch Prop 13. The vast majority of Californians have no idea what Prop 13 is because most voters actually are, look like me, right? They're younger, uh, they're people of color that were not here in California when Prop 13 passed or weren't even alive. Right, um, so we have a, a really big opportunity here uh, to, to make a big shift uh, in our state. That, that's very much why we wanted to make the film. When we got started with it, uh, it was right, it was almost 10 years ago, and it was around that time when, you know, uh, yeah, when uh, the the tuitions were going through the roof, and uh, you know the state was in fiscal crisis, and they were, you know, furloughing workers, they were closing down state parks, they were shortening the school year. I mean, the 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 state was really kind of falling apart, and we were all, you know, doing this 
uh, introspective, you know, what happened to our beautiful state of California that we all love thing, and we, we were trying to figure out what had happened, and the conversation kept kind of dead ending on Proposition 13, and, you know, we realized that very few people knew anything. I, I remembered it a little bit because, you know, I was alive, um, although kind of barely conscious, <laughs> and I was in the public schools in Los Angeles, and, you know, over the years, we kind of watched all the things get taken away from us, you know, the after school programs and the music programs and the sports programs and the librarians went away and the nurses went away, you know, every year or something, something else would, would go away. Student debt rose. Yeah, that's right. So one last question and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Uh, I want to, I'm curious about the title, First Angry Man. What is, what is that? I think it relates to the style of, uh, of politicking that, um, that Howard Jarvis was so astute at, um, at kind of creating. I think he created a lot of the language that we use today. We hear conservative uh, politicians use today. Um, and, uh, you know, we weren't calling it that for a long time. But um, then as we were finishing the film, there was this guy running for president um, who kind of reminded us of Howard Jarvis a lot. And that got us thinking about how, you know, there's sort of a, uh, a line of uh, these kind of politicians that use this sort of populist demagogic language, um, you know, the angry uh, white uh, politician. And um, so, yeah, it seemed, I'm sure that there were some before Howard Jarvis, but he was the first one that, he's the first one in our film, so that's what we call him. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's aptly titled. Uh, and, and, you know, I think, look, Anger in politics is an emotion that resonates. I mean, you know, people tap into that. Uh, you know, Jarvis, Trump, et cetera. It, you know, I, I think it's important to note, though, that it's not uh, an archetype that's available to too many other people. Uh, you don't hear a lot of successful people in politics who are like the angry Latino man, you know, the, the angry uh, black man, the angry Asian woman, black uh, Asian woman, et cetera. So, you know, I, I do think, I mean, even looking at it on the other end, he's coming at it from a different side of the spectrum, but, you know, somebody like Bernie Sanders is tapping into that. Nobody ever accused him of being a happy warrior. You know, he's certainly got a lot to be angry about, and people are, are responding to that. Uh, but it is something that's not available to everybody. Obama was elected because he was no drama Obama, right? He, was, he could not have been the angry black man. Um, I'll, I'll just close things out by saying if you're interested in our reform to Prop 13, you can find out more at schoolsandcommunitiesfirst.org. And if you want to sign the petition to qualify it for the ballot, come and see me afterwards. <laughs> you. So apparently you're just supposed to like shout out your questions at me. I'm going to come up. Do you want to stand I up? I was alive. Oh, can you stand yeah. up? Sorry. I was alive for Prop 13 and fought rapidly against it um, because those of us on the left could see what it meant. Um, but I was having a discussion about homelessness with an economist from Sweden, and he said that actually sales taxes are the most effective and really the best way, plus the wealth tax. So my question is, A, what do you think about sales tax? But more importantly, is Prop 8 lower taxes or raise taxes, not for the corporations, for the homeowner? What does it do to taxes for the homeowner? Your prop, whatever it's called. Yeah, so we don't have a prop number yet. That doesn't happen until we qualify it for the ballot. So right now it's just called the Schools and Communities Funding Act. It'll be assigned a prop number uh, once it qualifies. Uh, so our reform does not touch uh, residential properties whatsoever. So if a person is living in a property, whether it's an apartment building or a single family home, uh, this reform has nothing to do with that side of the consequences of Prop 13. And I think most of us agree that residential properties need to be taxed differently than corporate properties. And Prop 13 decided to treat all properties the same, right? So what we're doing is fixing the way that uh, Prop 13 treats corporate and industrial properties. Uh, by very simply uh, having corporations uh, 
pay fair market property taxes, to be assessed at current market value and pay property taxes based on that. Uh, so residential properties are exempted, agricultural properties are exempted, and small businesses are exempted. Uh, in fact, 8% of California's businesses are receiving 80% of the benefit from Prop 13 tax loopholes. Uh, so it really is Chevron and Wells Fargo and all those mega corporate landowners in California, these dynasty corporations that are benefiting from Prop 13. Uh, and of course, who's losing are schools and local services to the tune of $12 billion every single year. <laughs> now I am a property and I am following this rather closely. I also come from a history of small retail. That's how my family survived a very small margin. Retail is a very small margin. And I have asked people on what's now called the split roll, proposition 13 split roll, how do you qualify small business so you protect them? Because here in San Francisco, we are losing it. I've been told it's a $3 million threshold. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so uh, small businesses who own properties uh, that are uh, assessed at $3 million uh, or less would be exempt from the measure. And also small businesses, most small businesses here in San Francisco that are 75% uh, uh, residential, 25% uh, um, corporate and industrial, uh, only the 25% of the square footage that is corporate and industrial would be reassessed. So for example, many small businesses here in California, you have a, a bodega on the ground floor or you have retail on the ground floor, and then you have a couple of stories of uh, apartment buildings on top of that. If by square footage, um, you uh, have uh, less than 25% of that is corporate and industrial. So you have, you know, for example, the first floor is retail and then the next three or four floors are residential. Uh, you would also be exempt from the measure, right? So it's only if your majority of your, more than a quarter of your property is uh, commercial or industrial that you would even be reassessed. And if that's the case, then only the square footage that is commercial commercial and, -industri and industrial would be reassessed. Um, so it really is a minority of California businesses, the largest corporate landowners that would be reassessed at market value and paying out this $12 billion to fund our schools and local services. Um, I mentioned again that stat that 8% of California's businesses are receiving 80% of the benefit from Prop 13 uh, tax giveaways. Uh, so it's, you know, again, Chevron, Walmart, all of these huge mega land holders in California uh, that would pay. Uh-huh. Yeah, so the other thing that our uh, proposition does is it gives a gross uh, receipts exemption to small businesses. So this is actually the largest small business tax giveaway that we've had in a generation. Um, so if small businesses do find themselves sort of in the fray of this reassessment process and, and that their property taxes are going up, um, then we provide them a, a gross receipts tax write-off um, to allow them to defray some of those costs as well. Um, but I think, you know, we also need to ask ourselves sort of the larger question, right, in terms of like, you know, what, what benefit do businesses receive when we put money into our education and infrastructure, right? Uh, for decades, businesses have reaped the benefits of road infrastructure, uh, of an educated workforce, right, that can help to make their business thrive. Um, and so our measure says that, that businesses need to be paying that back into the system, that they're benefiting from that currently and they're not paying uh, for that, that cost. Um, furthermore, uh, 
homeowners have actually been paying more because businesses have been paying less. We had relative parity when it came to property taxes prior to Prop 13 uh, passing. We had almost equal amounts of property taxes being paid by businesses and by uh, residential. Uh, that proportion is now really out of whack, right? 70% of our property tax revenue comes from residential now through parcel taxes and other special taxes because we can't tax small or we can't tax businesses uh, to be able to pay their share of the part, right? So, so now businesses are paying 30% of the property taxes that the state has, and, and residential is paying 70%. Um, so homeowners uh, continue to suffer under this system when Chevron and, and Walmart don't pay their fair share. But we hear you on Cliff's hardware. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, no, what I'm saying is judicial challenges. Because, you know, in 2012, there was a judicial challenge to Article 13A. Yeah, I mean, there were challenges to Proposition 13's constitutionality, um, but it survived those, those challenges. Um, but we just didn't feel that was that felt a little in the weeds for, for this story. Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> They're there. No, well, I, I did contact them and I spoke with, um, with uh, you know, one of the, the founders, of the, one of the, uh, the first president after, uh, right after, I think the, the guy who was the president when they became the Howard Jarvis Tax Association, they had a previous name or whatever, but, um, and he was, you know, really interesting and funny and, and um, uh, but he didn't really have any um, sort of relevant stories. He didn't know Howard Jarvis, he didn't have, a lot of experience with him. Um, uh, we did talk to a lot of people. We we focused more on people who like worked with Howard Jarvis at the time, like um, like uh, um, uh, Joel Fox, uh, who also worked with the Howard Jarvis Tax Association. And ran to go. I mean, the the goal of the film was to stay in that moment of, of history. So we wanted we wanted to talk primarily to actors who were really taking part of the action at the moment. We didn't seek out, we, we talked to lots of people for research and to understand the story deeply, but we didn't seek to interview on camera people who were not first you know, players in the action at the time. Yeah, we would have, they, they, were go, they had to go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> Um, to answer your question about how does the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association feel about the Schools and Communities First campaign, um, they oppose, obviously, because um, we're trying to undo some of what they did. Um, but we have a list of over 600 endorsers and growing, including Tony Thurmond, the State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Uh, most of the uh, candidates running for president, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Pete uh, Buttigieg, uh, Kamala Harris, although that's no longer relevant. Um, so most of the uh, most of the uh, presidential uh, candidates support our, our reform. Um, all of our local assembly members. Uh, Scott Weiner has been a huge champion of our campaign. Uh, David Chu, Phil Ting over in the East Bay, Rob Bonta, Buffy Wicks. Uh, just about everybody that you would want to have on board with our campaign um, is on board um, because I think people on the left really see uh, the necessity for this to to happen. I'll say this about the Howard Jarvis Tax Association, which is that they're kind of the most, they're sort of all the Republican Party in California has left right now. So they're, they, I think that they play a role in, in California in kind of keeping the legislature in check. Um, and, uh, you know, until, until the Republican Party can, you know, stage some kind of a comeback in California, they're sort of a placeholder. Um, but they, you know, they, they're very focused on this one this one thing, and they they believe very strongly in sort of the sanctity of Proposition 13, and you know no matter how uh, sort of 
sane the reform might be, they're going to oppose it. Totally. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no doubt, right, that uh, corporations are going to spend a lot of money to ensure that they can keep the tax giveaway that they were uh, given during Prop 13. Um, so we know that, you know, not only the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, but these mega corporations that are benefiting the most from Prop 13 um, are going to fight to keep that tax break. Um, so we've got a, a coalition of uh, about 100 organizations uh, that are working on this statewide. Um, uh, to do the the grassroots level voter education that's necessary, um, because while you know they'll certainly dump money into the airwaves in order to ensure that voters are hearing anti schools and communities first messages, um, we have something that they'll never have, which is authentic messengers, people like you, hopefully, who talk to their friends and their neighbors and fellow voters in their community about this, uh, and who have a level of trust and familiarity because you're a part of this community um, that Chevron is just never going to have. Um, so. So we, we have a huge coalition of, of supporting organizations that are organizing actively around this. I think I mentioned a few of them, like League of Women Voters and ACLU and Ace Action, um, that are out there, boots on the ground, knocking doors, talking to voters um, to make this campaign happen. Um, and certainly, if you're interested in this reform and think that it's uh, vital and important, you can volunteer and, and go to schoolsandcommuniesfirst.org to be a part of that movement. Also, we can send around the film. Yeah, where do we ca access the film? Thank you for asking it. Um, <laughs> Get so, to work. So the the film is um, so there's actually another screening in in a couple of days in Oakland, but if you go to our website firstangryman.com, we're also trying to get the film out in front of communities. We're trying. We we think it's a film that. Um, that will resonate with groups of people who want to talk about it as a as a as, as a starting point. So, you know, we're we're actually reaching out to a lot of organizations in California to see if they want to host screenings, and people can sign up to ho to host screenings on our website. And then it will end up on PBS shortly before the election in November. We don't have a date yet, but until then, we're hoping to have lots of screenings around California to help foster a good conversation. I want to say one thing to respond to that question, though, which is. Um, you know, we're, we, we're not taking any position on the Schools and Communities First um, Act. We're journalists, and that wasn't sort of the point of this film, was not to, you know, talk about any legislation or, or um, anything like that. Um, but as journalists, um, I do think it's important to combat uh, disinformation, and the, there is an effort to paint this legislation, this proposed legislation, as being a repeal of Proposition 13, which it absolutely is not. And so that's one thing that I would, you know, hope that uh, people, when, you know, when you're having those conversations around the dinner table or whatever, or with your family, um, you know, uh, fight back against that. If people say, you know, they're trying to repeal Prop 13, they're not trying to repeal Prop 13. They're trying to fix one part of it.
Yeah, I, I, I talked, totally. I, I talked to Gray Davis uh, about this at length, and um, there's a couple things. One is, you know, I think there's a, a, a lesson here in, in sort of coalition politics. It was such a big coalition of groups that were opposed to Proposition 13. You had, you know, like the banks were opposed to Proposition 13, you know, big business in general. Even the Chamber of Commerce in California was opposed to Proposition 13. So you have, you know, on one side you have those kind of powerful forces, and then you had the labor unions and the PTA, and I mean, everyone was opposed to Proposition 13, and it was very hard to get them on the same page about how to fight it. And so I think that that was a big problem. So they, they would just kind of like roll out different um, attacks and, you know, it was all kind of piecemeal and nothing was, was um, they, they didn't sort of stick with, with anything. And then towards the end of the campaign, they were going with that. You know, it's a, it's a giveaway to big business, but that was, you know, the big businesses were not really excited about that. So they didn't, I don't think that they went in, you know, uh, with a lot of enthusiasm with that tack. And, and what Gray Davis said, by the way, is, you know, in the end, voters sort of felt like, well, I don't care if big businesses get a, a, tax break, a tax break as long as I get my tax break too. And, you know, that's, you know, I think that's sort of a shortcoming in the American electorate that we're a little bit short-sighted that way. Yeah, that's what I was gonna add, is that it, it, ultimately if people who felt that their, their property taxes were too high were going to receive quote unquote relief, they weren't gonna care whether or not Chevron was also going to get a break, so. Yeah. One last question. So this is my first time, I call it so, but uh, first time seeing Prop 13. Um, and I appreciate the, the, the way in which you portrayed it. Um, there was one idea that I didn't fully grasp. Could you speak to how Prop 13 helped widen Yeah, that's, you know, I, it's a complex question. Like, how, how did Prop 13 contribute to the inequality? Um, and I think that we, by necessity, allied a lot of things in this film. Like, you know, the, the, we talk about Proposition 13 leading to a tax revolt nationally. So obviously, Prop 13 on its own did not increase inequality in the country. It did it by triggering similar um, you know, tax cuts and, and spending limitation bills all over the country. Um, and also, you know, I think that we're not trying to make the argument that tax cuts alone um, have created the, the inequality gap that we have now. I, I think what we're trying to say is that it's part of a suite of economic policies that have contributed um, you know, you have the, the decline of unions, which has been as a result of, you know, um, uh, union busting policies. Um, you have changes in corporate compensation uh, legislation. You have uh, financial deregulation. I mean, there's so many things. There's like a suite of economic policies over this 40 years that have taken place. But I think that what's What's different about tax cuts is, like if you're running for Congress or Senate, you don't run for Senate by saying you're gonna bust the unions or you're gonna, or you're gonna you know, deregulate the financial industry, right? You run for Congress by saying you're gonna cut people's taxes, give them back their money, let them make their own decisions with how they spend their money. So the tax cut, the tax cut weapon has kind of been the the tip of the spear of a suite of economic policies that have uh, created this change in America over the last 40 years. That's, if I had time to say that in the film, that's what we would have said, but uh, and so I, we smashed it. I would also say there's, there's you know, a, a sort of direct connection between uh, the widening wealth gap uh, in California, you know, maybe not the whole country, but in California and Prop 13 in the sense that like, there's really two effective tools that we have in order to close the wealth gap, right? We can either directly transfer uh, funds to uh, lower income people through tax refunds like the earned incomes tax credit for low income people, um, or we can effectively put money back in people's pockets by providing them service 
services, right? So that you're not having to outlie funds uh, for your healthcare or for private education to make up for the fact that your public education is so bad um, or to own a car because the public transportation is so bad, right? And so if we're providing people, especially at lower uh, levels of the income spectrum uh, with those direct services, uh, that's, that's another way to lift families out of poverty, right? So, um, you know, we still have the earned income tax credit on a federal level, which is great, um, but uh, what we don't have is services for lower income people that they're having to find other ways to pay for. Um, so that makes poor people even poorer, right? You didn't have the money to begin with to spend on healthcare, and now your publicly subsidized healthcare uh, is cut, and so you're having to figure out how to spend more money on healthcare or to not pay for your prescription medication to put food on the table and trade ponies to make all these compromises. Okay, well, um, who wants to pay taxes? Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out. Sign the petition with me. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Camille. Thank Thanks. you, Tanoj. Thanks, Thank everyone. You, Steph Indy.